Hey, everybody, welcome to another conversation. These conversations have been just so beautiful to me because the opportunity to sit with someone you don't know and have an opportunity to get to know them over a, an hour long period of time. In this case, we have about 45 minutes because Emmy has someplace she has, she has another hard stop at, at the, at the, on the hour. But um, they've been fabulous. They've been really interesting because some of the conversations have been enlightening, some of them have been uh, tearful, some of them have been funny, some of them have been inspiring, um, some of them have been boring, but it's all of them have been good because it really doesn't matter what they are. It matters that two people come together. And my goal in this, in this, um, in this room is to love and accept people, to acknowledge and validate people for what they're saying, and to listen and hear people. And in a world today where people are yelling at each other and, and not even pausing long enough to hear what the other person's saying, but formulating while someone's talking what they're gonna say and they're interrupting and they're talking and they're doing all that. Um, it, I really feel just by the simple practice of doing this work of listening, our world could change a lot. So I don't wanna make this a monologue because it's not about me. It's, I want to introduce you to Emmy Goreka. Emiliana Goreka, yes, otherwise known as Emmy. <laughs> Emi, Emiliana Goreka, also known as Emmy. So I'm going to call her Emmy because that's easier for me. Emmy, how are you today? Hi, good, good. I mean, you know, Monday morning under quarantine um, and handling kids and work. We're good. Yeah, yeah. You know, we we say that so quickly, and everybody that just goes great, fabulous, and, and moves on to the next question. But I really want to stay here for a second, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. because you mentioned it. We're under a quarantine. We're in the midst of a of a civil rights revolution. We're in the midst of a Me Too movement, which is almost taken backstage, but it doesn't. It's not backstage at all. We're in the midst of having a lot of the basic concepts of what we believe and have grown up to believe over the course of a lot of years really shaken uh, and rightfully shaken, in my opinion, because it needs to be shaken. Um, how are you really doing? I think I think I, I'm actually really feel that I am good. I feel um, really um, blessed that you know my kids have not gotten sick we've not gotten sick we are still comfortable um is it the best of situations no but at the same time we have to really focus on what we do have if we continuously focus on what we don't have um as a family as a unit in society that's where we sort of start the suffering um in, in my opinion um, and under the, you know, civil rights revolution, it's really, I think COVID has brought out more of the same, right? So technically, if you were unhappy, you're probably unhappier now, yeah. right? Um, COVID, I think, has sort of magnified uh, the suffering of our communities, uh, you know, our black and brown people, of women, of you know, parents, um, when we talk about, you know, the pandemic that we currently have, we have two pandemics, we have a pandemic of COVID, and then we have the racism pandemic. And um, that one's been around for a long, a longer amount of time, and we're yeah. still not over it. So I think for, for me, I really do feel blessed to be comfortable enough to continue to work, and not everybody can do that. Yes, I completely understand. You know, lately I've been really drawn to the music of the '60s. It was it was my time. It was, uh, and the music of the '60s was another revolution. And I was just reflecting back on it the other day because I actually thought in the '60s we had made a mark, that we had made an impact, and it was going to last. And I sort of feel bl blessed to have a chance to be a part of remaking it because it didn't last. It lasted for a few years, 
but it didn't really last. And we're back dealing with a lot of the same issues. I'm posting on my Facebook page every day a song of protests from the 60s. And right. the, the songs of protests from the 60s could easily be songs today. I mean, the rhythms and the beats are not what people are saying, but uh, they're as relevant today as they were before. Of course, definitely. And I'm a kid of the 90s. I mean, yeah. I remember the 90s thinking, you know, women are empowered. We have Alanis Morissette. We've got a Lilith Fair. We, we, we got it going on as women. We're going to take over the world. And then here I am, 2020, <laughs> fighting for equity. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel you. I feel you. <laughs> so, Emmy, what do you think makes us want to separate around such superficial things of color of skin, of form of body, um, of what, who should be able to love, love one another. I mean, you would think that those are just such superficial differences that if you asked a thousand people from a different planet, what would people separate around these things? I'm I'm pretty sure most of them would say no way. That's I mean those are those are, it's like I'm wearing a red shirt, you're wearing a blue shirt. Who cares? But right, I think that that's taught to us early on. It's really taught to us early on. Um, I think I think that we don't have a consciousness of it, right? Um, but as you, as kids, you start to learn certain behaviors. Um, it's almost like when people ask you, what do you do for a living? They're sort of sizing you up of how much respect should I be giving? Wow. Right, so it's really- um, it's, So it's, that's the reason nobody's ever respected me. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that, is, that is part of it. Um, I'm gonna tell you that I'm Latina Jew. I'm, I'm um, you know, I live on the west side of Los Angeles. Um, uh, women that look like me and kids that look like my kids are often looked at as um, you almost don't belong here. Sometimes they'll say it, um, but I had a mom ask me just recently, she said, Emmy, why don't you do a lot of play dates with your kids? I said, well, under COVID, we're not doing that. But before that, why didn't I? And this is a good friend of mine. And I said, um, okay, based on where we live at, anywhere I show up with my kids, um, I, they think I'm the nanny. Wow. And they speak to me like the nanny. I said, but wow. also, my kids are often put in a situation where they have to explain that their mom is not the nanny. Wow. But also, these small kids are used to being in charge of somebody that looks so I, I, I get to the play date and it's like, can you do this? You need to walk me over. And so I need it for my kids to really not be around that. Um, and we choose our friends carefully so that our friends know that they're equal. Wow. Right? That <laughs> it's taught early on. It's really, I mean, you're talking about five, six year olds. Um, I was sitting with when my oldest is now 10 and I remember him going to preschool and we went to the park and I had a little girl tell me if I was on a break. Wow. <laughs> so she wow. already knew you're working for us. <laughs> Are you on a break? Wow. 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 <laughs> you're talking four or five year olds. So I want to bring the listener in for a moment and I just want to ask. Like when you hear what Emmy's saying, what do you feel? Like, how does that make you feel that someone who is very educated, because I, I met her through a, through a complete befuddlement of, of, of thoughts. Uh, I went to a school called Pitzer. I, ju I, I just got involved a little bit getting back to know Pitzer. And one of the people that is, is sort of in the, I, I don't even remember what it, what she does, but she is a friend of Emmy's. And I, I, I thought, well, I'm gonna contact Emmy because I'm looking to get in touch with people who went to Pitzer, but she didn't go to Pitzer. She went to Harvard, by the way. And so <laughs> this is a Harvard, a person who went to Harvard, who's being treated by five-year-old kids as if she's the nanny. Like, 
does that turn your stomach or what? Like, how is that even possible? And I want to share with you, I, like, when I came out, I'm, I'm obviously Jewish. I, uh, I was one day away from being ordained a rabbi in Israel. I left the day before I was going to be ordained. But when I came out of my mother's womb, I remember looking at my body and saying, and saying, what the heck happened? And, and I, I was mad at the God that created me because I had put on my form on my order form that I wanted to be a black man. And, and I, I looked at my skin. I said, this isn't a black man. What are you doing? And so you would think that a kid that came in wanting to be black would have a high, t a high preference to be with people of darker color. But I took this, the, was it Harvard or Stanford? Stanford, one of them had a, a, a preference test that you take around color and finances and all those things to see how your prejudices are. We and all have them. I was shocked to see that I have a high preference for people of lighter color skin. And I, I, I would think that, like I was shocked at that. But when you think you grow up, light is a good thing. Dark is a bad, bad thing. The cowboys that I watched, were, the good guys wore white hats. The bad guys wore black hats. You know, colorism, yes. Colorism, there's such a huge colorism uh, bias that we don't even realize that when we take those tests, they show us images and good and bad, and, and are, we just naturally go to what we've, we've grown up thinking. Absolutely. I mean, I grew up, I grew up in Chicago. I grew up in um, Cabrini Green. I grew up in a very black neighborhood. Um, and then at a time also where a certain area was coming up where they called it Jew town. Um, you know, so I'm this, little Latina with my parents. I mean, we had, my, so I'm one of 13 kids. Um, so, I mean, I grew up in really a diverse sort of city that segregated. Yeah. Right. So you knew sort of where the lines were and definitely I think that shapes um, how you grow up. I think that that shapes almost your entire identity. Um, and I don't think most people think about it. Most people want to say you're not your zip code, but the reality is that we are our zip code. Yeah. And what is around us, what we consider to be good, what we consider to be bad is based on our upbringing. The book that's sitting over my left shoulder is what I wrote, is what I wrote. And it surprised me that I wrote it because it's a, it's a fable. I left, I wanted to write my legacy. And it's a fable, which surprised me also because I never thought I would write a fable as my legacy. Um, and I was a little bit of a snob growing up. I, I wasn't, I was, I was born in a lower class, lower middle class family. Um, my parents passed away when I was 13 and 15, two years apart on the same day. And I moved in with an aunt and uncle who were, who were household names in a different in a different part of the country i grew up in philly they were in 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 the midwest and somehow what happened for me is i saw a lot of different worlds very early on but then i became a spiritual person also and i i wanted to just hang out with people that were spiritually of a certain level i wanted to eat food that was prepared in a certain way and so i was a little bit of a snob and so when I wrote the mosaic, the mosaic's a story about a boy who loses his parents two years apart on the same day. And when he asks the adults where his parents are, they tell him they're in a place called heaven. So mm. he sets out in search of the place called heaven because he just wants to be with his parents. But the people he meets are not the clergy people or the medicine women or the shamans or the priests or the, or the rabbis. He meets the street worker and the homeless guy and the... And the um, waitress and the gardener he meets common ordinary people the trash man and he says i wonder why i'm meeting these people i'm trying to find heaven and he says but i don't have anything to do i'm just I, I might as well sit with them and listen and in every single case when he listened to them tell their story what he realized is they weren't at all the people that he thought they were when he first came up to see them cool. mm -hmm. And when he had that happen over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, 
he started to ask himself the question, I wonder what I would see if I got out of my own way. Because I don't see who, th who people are, I see what I am. So if I could slide left, what would the world look like without me interrupting it? And at that moment, he saw a monk unzipping the sky and walking him, inviting him to walk through to a parallel reality where he met the wise one who was the keeper of the mosaic. But one of the things that just intrigued me about that is that we are not what we seem. We're all told you can't judge a book by its cover, but we certainly do. Mm -hmm. Oh, completely. I mean, I, um, I remember a few years back in South Los Angeles, I put together this community picnic and I, <laughs> I was naive. I put together a flyer that said that superstars will show up. And what we did was we brought in, um, we brought in a community leaders, people that let, you know, whether it was a housing program, whether it was a kids programming, and so we had put the flyer together, superstars, and people came to this event and they were looking for A-listers. They were looking for Denzel Washington yeah. and Brad Pitt and whatever they made up in their mind was a superstar. Yeah. And so when we brought up you know, the really uh, deep-rooted community leadership, and we honored them and gave them flowers and whatnot. And we said, these are the superstars. There were people that you heard sigh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because they had built up and they had already imagined and what was a superstar. Yeah. And so really, I think, I think it gave more respect to these community leaders because they were being honored as, as superstars as ha having the wherewithal to really continue with a lot of underfunded programs and resources. Um, but just the shock of, oh, these are the superstars, I yeah. guess. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, lo I love that. Emmy, what's important to you? I think family is important to me. I think that that has always um, been important. I think I think when we get, you know, um, really deep down to what do we value, um, to me, it's always been family. You know, if I'm having a rough time with my business or with my kids, who do I turn to? It's my community. It's my family. Um, and sometimes family doesn't have to be blood. So to me, it's that that community. Um, I was a few years back, I was in San Francisco putting together this huge program for um, my event production company. And I really felt overwhelmed. Um, I remember being at the BART station and you know, I'm like, ah. So I had um, this woman gets off the BART station and says, Emmy from across and mind you, I didn't, recognize her and I was like hi <laughs> she says and I'm out there overwhelmed it was an advertising campaign it was a multi-million dollar deal for me and so for me I was a, a little overwhelmed yeah. and she says I know you from Temple our wow. kids go to, yeah our kids go to class and so like we had a cup of coffee I'm still very good friends with her but just like that connection of you belong to my temple we're out here let's you know she was there for for an interview so she yeah. was there for an interview and we connected and to me i remember i remember walking away like it's gonna be okay like my community just <laughs> showed up for me yeah. at the heart station yeah. um but so, so let, me, let me dive down into that a minute because <laughs> is it community that's that's valuable to you or is it connection that's valuable I think it's the one and the same, community okay. and connection. I think you can't have community without connection. Can't connect. So for those of who are listening, who are parts of a community, but don't feel connected to the community, what would you say? I would say find a way to connect, especially if you know you are part of a community. Um, and I can count my friends in one hand, but I feel like I'm part of a larger community. Right. I feel like, you know, my friend that stopped in yesterday, I hadn't seen her in months, probably around COVID. She belongs to my temple, texted me, I mean, I'm around the corner. Will you do a distance walk with me? Wow. We walked a block and a half. It wasn't long, 
the, the connection was there. She texted. I said, I'll come out. We'll put my mask on and we'll, you know, so find a way to connect. Find a way to, especially if you know you have a community. There are people that don't necessarily have a community. I would love to toss something up to you because I love the way you think already and I'd love to see what you think about this. So it's going to take a couple seconds to lob it over the net. Okay. But um, I remember when I first found my community of people, my like-minded community, I, I felt like I died and went to heaven because I couldn't believe there were people as crazy as I was who believed the way I believed, who thought the way I thought, who felt the way I felt that I didn't need to stand up and rationalize what I believed in front of them because they understood what I believed, because they were a part of me. And I, and I remember how beautiful that felt in those moments to feel that. What I'm noticing now is as beautiful as those like-minded communities are, they're actually starting to become the downfall of what I believe is our civilization. Mm. Because our like-minded communities are getting stronger and bigger. And the gaps between our like-minded community and other like-minded communities are getting wider and deeper. And we stand yelling from one silo to another about why our community is good, maybe or maybe not. But even if we don't, we sort of exclude those people that are not a part of our like-minded community, not even knowingly sometimes. And I wonder if the world was created with silos or without silos. It seems to me that God created the universe without silos. And he created it with open fields so that we could all come together. In business, when we go with unlike-minded people and bring unlike-minded people in, we get something called innovation. In, in communities, we get diversity. In, fr in communities of friendship, we get diversity. And I wonder if diversity and innovation are missing a little bit from our like-minded communities. Your thoughts? I'm going to push back a little bit. Please, I love it. I think that diversity, um, when it, it, the reason we're separated is because we're missing inclusion. Inclusion. So, so diversity is we have the right pieces in the room. And I always explain it this way. Imagine I invite you to a party. You're going to come to my house party and you're going to come to all my Latino friends party, right? You're invited. You get to come in the room, but you get to sit in the corner. I pick the music. I pick the food. And everybody's wearing colorful outfits. And you don't get to dance. Inclusion is you're coming to my party. Hey, I'm going to make guacamole. Do you want to make guacamole? Let's do it together. Yeah. Right. Oh, you like it spicier than I do. This is what's going to be the playlist. What do you think? Oh, you like cha-cha. Yes, let's do cha-cha. Right. So I think that what is missing and why we're having a really difficult time right now is because we, years back, I remember when they started calling me Hispanic. I was like, Hispanic? So we are missing the inclusion piece. Yeah. We master diversity because we sat down and put affirmative action plans and whatnot and so people thought well i checked this box i did this but the inclusion piece and leadership of a lot of other voices have, have been missing so that's sort of the piece for me that i think this is where we are now i call it the reckoning yeah. <laughs> of affirmative action um because we thought that it would just be okay to say okay we checked off the boxes and they're there but they're they're at the party but they can't really yeah. dance no you can't really choose we don't we don't really want that you know so i think we are at at at, at, the, at a time where we now need to talk about what is it i love that and it sounds like to me that you've done some thought around inclusion yes what i think where do we where do we go from where we are here to not only have diversity but to have inclusion we have to i always ask look around you if you are if everyone in the room consistently just looks like you we're missing the whole point of humanity right yeah. you know who's really great at it is my husband huh. my husband 
we'll come home and say, my friends are coming over. And I say, okay, let's, we'll figure out what's doing. He doesn't say my black friend's coming over. Yeah. My Latino friend is coming over. You know, and, and my husband grew up Jewish on the west side of LA, but he said, my parents never had black friends. I said, they didn't? He said, they never called them black friends. They were yeah. friends. I love that. I was like, oh, that bone. And now I see why he was going out with this Latina. <laughs> yeah. Right? But if we think about it and we say, okay, let's, who's missing in the room? Whose voice is missing in the room? Who's making the decisions and for whom? Yeah. I think is key. It seems you already come from a, a conscious place, though, of even noticing that and wanting to notice that and wanting to see what voices are missing. But it feels to me like the silos have become so strong that we don't even realize in many cases that their voices are and, and diversity and inclusion missing in our silo because we look at it and I don't want to get political because it's not a good thing to do. But when you look at the Democratic Convention and you see the representation of what they try to cast under the tent of the Democratic Party, and you look at the Republican Convention and you look at what they try and cast under the, under the tent of the Republican Party, there's a lot missing in one of, in one of those parties. And, um, and they brought in their four or five people that represent what it is they're looking to have. But when you look at, when you look at the mosaic of the Democratic Party, they didn't bring in anybody to be included. They, it was the inclusion. It was what the world looks like. Right? They were already included. They were They're, in leadership position. What the they, Republican Party brought in was a spokesperson, the diversity, not the inclusion. I love that. I love that. Right? So they, the talking head they brought, but we know that they're not leadership. So how do you show someone who doesn't see what they don't see? I think we first have to acknowledge that sometimes when we don't speak up, we, we may see it, but we don't speak up. We don't quite know what to do. Is acknowledge that it's happening, but also how to move forward. I think there's a lot of shaming going on in society right now. Of like, you're a white lady, you're white, and they, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Right? I mean, so I think acknowledging that, yes, racism has existed. I did not know how badly it affected people. It's okay to say that. I yeah. did not know. But now that you do know, how can we move forward? How can you be an ally? How can you make sure that it's, that you are working on the inclusion piece? Because you may be in rooms that you have a voice and your voice matters or you are able to lift someone up. I had a neighbor speak to me about um, the Black Lives Matter movement and her and I don't see eye to eye on things. Um, she's, yes, Republican and that's okay. That's her choice. But um, she spoke to me about it. She said, I, I didn't know it existed and I don't know what to do. I said, so do you now acknowledge that it exists? She says, it has to exist. How are these kids getting, you know, killed by the police? And it says racism. Okay, so now we can get somewhere. You, know, you now are acknowledging that it exists. And now how can you speak up? I said, you could start. There are small things you could do. Yeah. And in my neighborhood, they started a neighborhood watch program to watch who they did not know was a black neighbor. Wow. They saw black people in the community and the bias was already something that is going to happen. Yeah. And so I said, you could start there. You are next door. You've seen some of the posts that come up. You could really talk about what it is. So she ended up hosting a small meeting and I didn't, I didn't talk to her after that, but her kids put together a um, small Black Lives Matter march in our community, which is unheard of. Right, right. So now 
her her talking about it and researching and you know trying to figure it out has also spurred her kids who are 17 and 18 to acknowledge and figure out how they're going to help instead of be silent on, on, on the situation. Yeah. That's critical. I love that. I sit in my chair much like a monk, much like the fool on the hill. And I live my life trying to love the world around me. Um, and I don't go out that much anymore because of COVID and because I have some pains in my body that don't allow me to move as much as I once could. And I watched the Democratic Convention and it was either the first night or the second night, I can't remember which, but Michelle Obama spoke. And I was really moved. I, I just love seeing a powerful, compassionate, heart-centered woman speaking about issues of the day with power, not, not as a wimp, but with, with power. And my wife and I talk about it a lot. She's Latina also, by the way. Um, we talk about it a lot that there aren't that many role models of strong women. So women, when they want to be strong, look to the masculine model of what strength is or powerful and, and they become, sometimes they become little men rather than women. And I saw in, Mich in Michelle Obama, a powerful woman who wasn't a man. So on my Facebook page, I, I, I try and be politically correct where I am because I, I embrace all I want to talk to all sides of the mosaic. I want everybody to feel included. And I just put Michelle Obama's speech, your thoughts. I thought a pretty innocent post. I got a lot of people that felt like I felt, but I got so many vile responses, so much hatred, so much anger, so much shame, so much, you know, that I, I ended up taking the post down because I, I, it made me feel I'm empathic and, and I wasn't expecting it. And it just made me feel like sad for the world that we live in. So it's all well and good. Long, long introductions to questions. You'll find that about me. I'm so sorry. It's great that people in a community of people are organizing a Black Lives Matter conversation or march or whatever in a community that it would be unheard of to do that in. And yet, I think the reason so many people are not is because they don't want to have to deal with the vile that comes their way when they stand up to represent what it is they believe. What do you have to say about that? I think there's a few points here. I think that the reason you see the vile um, rhetoric that comes at Michelle Obama is one, because she's a strong female. We still in the United States lack the vision to see women in leadership. Yeah. Um, this was the Hillary effect as well. Um, you know, we still live in a very misogynistic society, and then you're going to add color to it. Michelle Obama is a white woman. We would be right. really honoring her for her strength and her leadership, her empathy, right? Um, she happens to be black. And so that is part of what we're dealing with in society. But the biggest thing is really um, misogyny. I remember my dad, and keep in mind, dad has seven girls and five boys. And dad said to me when Hillary was running, that Hillary cannot win. Wow. And I said, why? This is because she was running against Trump. I, she's the most qualified, absolutely. And dad said, no, we picked a black, inexperienced black man over an experienced woman, and it's going to happen again. Wow. He said, we are not used to, nor do we want women telling us what to do. He included himself. In that. Uh -huh. <laughs> I 
had never heard it that way. And he was right. Um, this was, you know, um, a shock to me. And then when I look at sort of my history, I can see how I've been um, turned on for positions. I, you know, it's it's the female factor is is key. I mean, we're called bees. You know, you're a bee, a ball buster. I don't even know what else we've been called. Completely yeah. disrespected. And so what it is is that they will not accept leadership from a female and from a female of color is a whole other dynamic. And that's, I'm sorry. I, I wish we had the courage to raise, raise our boys the way we raise our girls. Yeah. To equalize. Yeah. I, I'm a little bit of an empath. And so I feel things before I think they come. And I really feel that there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. And I want to add this dimension to it and just see what your thoughts are on it. Because again, I love your thought process. Um, I believe males, the male dominant character realizes that his time here is almost over. That there's a new paradigm of leadership that's coming into the world that the male model has no longer has an idea how to lead. Um, and that and that model is a female model. It's a feminine model. Uh, and that that feminine model is essential for us to take the next step forward. It's a model of love. It's a model of acceptance. It's a model of, of support. It's a model of lifting up rather than dominating down. And I believe that that we cannot take the steps we need to take. We can't get out of this thinking, as Bucky Fuller said. We can't, we can't solve the problems of the past with the thinking of the past. Mm -hmm. We have to create a new model that makes the old model obsolete. I believe that new model is happening. I believe that new model is coming. I believe the little bit that I know about the work that I, you do, I believe that you're, you could be a bigger voice in it than you even are. <laughs> I think, I think that, that the time is, is come for really women to step up into leadership or step into leadership. I think that when we look at the model of society, um, some of it is not working. And so we've already tried the male leadership. Yeah. Let's, let's try the female leadership. How many more wars, wars can women get, get yeah. us into? Um, the, but the realistic part of it is that when you look around the world at countries that are led by female, it's a very different mentality. It's a yeah. very different, um, almost empathy model for the world. And so I think we're ready for that. So are women ready to have a woman leader? Some of us are. Hmm. I'll say that. Yeah. Some of us are because I've had this conversation for the past, I'm going to say four years. Um, but I didn't realize that I was having this conversation early in my life. Um, I, you know, I opened my first business at 18. And by the time I hit 30, I realized that I had never had a um, female in leadership as a CAO, as a CFO. So I did not have a path to create this, wow. right? What does, what does maternity, leave, maternity leave look for a female business owner? Yeah. How can she expand that in her own business? And I mean, just, to, just, just something as little as that. And at the time, I remember my social media big company and our policy was that if you wanted to work from home, you could. Beautiful. Right? And this is before COVID, but I remember thinking, wow, my mom had 13 kids and she said we had six weeks maternity leave. Six weeks? I was like, this is wow. 
how are we <laughs> doing right. this? crazy so i think i think that the there are in there's enough pushback where some females do not believe that we're ready and some do firmly believe that men are better leaders yeah and to that i say how many female leaders have you had that's right totally i i love when a conversation sort of circles around because my, in my days of pitzer which i only spent two years there because i i i I got there at 16 and I, I left at 18 because I had taken all the courses I needed to take to have an undergraduate degree and I didn't want to get the undergraduate degree in psychology and anthropology that I was looking at. Um, but And so I decided I was going to hitchhike around the world. But one of the big things that I was looking for is there was a woman there in the anthropology department and it was women, like this was the, this was 1970 when I went there. So a lot of the women's lib movement was just getting started and and I was all for it. I was, you know, and I, I, I walked into the women's lib class, the only guy, and I almost got, you know, you talk about being at your party and being stuck <laughs> in the corner. I, I, was, I was stuck on the dartboard. Until, Not inclusive. Not inclusive. <laughs> until the teacher said to me, said to people in the class, um, you have no idea who you're throwing darts at. Danny and I are doing a study right now around, around a tribe in Africa where the males actually lactate so the women can work. And we're doing, a, we're doing a study on male lactation to see if we can bring male lactation to the, to the forefront because if it can happen in one African tribe, it can happen all around the world. And so the government, we were looking for a, a grant and the government was like, you know, there's no way we're giving that to you. Um, but but we found evidence of it. And so there's just so much we don't know about the world that we live in and what's possible and, this, and the, the boxes we've put people in that, that keep us confined. What makes you happy? I think the challenge of things make me happy. I really do. I think that um, I'm... I'll say it. Most people are like, Emmy's a workaholic. I'm like, no, I'm not a workaholic. I like to see impact and I want to see impact in my lifetime, right? I have, I have two young boys and I mean, I think that they're seeing the culture shift. Um, yeah. You know, they just recently said to me, mom, who's Bill Clinton? And <laughs> my, my 10 year old who's, who's always around when we're speaking politics says, Sure that's that's Hillary Clinton's husband. Oh wow, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Where <laughs> ten years ago you would have said Hillary is right, totally. Clinton's husband. So I see the culture shift. I like the impact. I think that youth is really highly aware of inclusion, um, highly aware of equity for women. So I think that um, working towards that and impact, I think. That is what makes me happy. No. Um, the seeing that, I'm like, oh my goodness, I was not that awake. We weren't, we didn't know in high school and, you know, middle school, all of the turmoil and to get to equity, to get to, you know, um, equality. Um, so we're not even close to doing the normal show that I do, which is perfectly fine. And I want to be honorable of your time. Um, as I mentioned in the 60s, I thought we had it. I thought we had a group that was strong enough in our belief systems. I thought we, I thought our music reflected it. I thought our culture reflected it. I thought the impact that we had, I thought the demonstrations that we did, I thought all the things really got people to stand aside for a minute and say, what's happening in this world? And maybe their hair is too long and they don't take a bath and maybe they do too many drugs. But they are, there's something that they're saying that, that resonates and it did resonate. And then we all grew up and went into, and went into work and started making money and doing what we do and not, we didn't lose our cause, but we just were not there. How do we keep this time present? How do we make it so this just doesn't happen this in the sixties all over again? Well, I think that the key is 
for at least for me, for Women's March, Women's March Foundation, and people that are marching, what they don't realize is that the hard work is after march. Yeah. But the hard work is continuing to stay loud, continuing to really affect political change. And in order to do that, in order to do that, um, we have to do the work and the work is difficult and the work is challenging because it's challenging ourselves and our belief system. Do we believe in equity? Do we believe, you know, that we can get there? And what will it take there? And we may be uncomfortable for a while, right? So no change comes without you being uncomfortable, without some people being uncomfortable. So I think that that's key. It's we're not just marching. We also have to build political power. For too long, we've let others decide, right? While we're out there, marching and doing what we have to do, we also have to continue to hold our politicians accountable, right? And we also have to build up community leaders beyond marching, beyond the, the demonstrations, because that is where everything happens. I mean, your city councilman has more power than anybody ever thinks, but we don't think about it. We're like, ah, I didn't vote. <laughs> for that, you know, okay. So I think part of it is that acknowledging that we're going to be uncomfortable for a little bit, but that we have to keep up the fight because it is the world that we're leaving for our kids. Yeah. What do you say to people that have lost faith in that system, that have watched good people become corrupt, that have watched people get bought out, that people lose their values, people leave behind what, what they actually, because the system, like, I almost believe the system doesn't work. Um, under separate cover, I would love to talk to you about something that I'm trying to put together, which is um, around the collective mind that has nothing, when you vote, in, when you vote for somebody, you're already separating out, you're voting for this one, not that one. But there's something now that people are doing research. I'm working with some people out of Stanford who have created an algorithm to allow the human mind who thinks vertically and thinks uh, one or the other to actually think collectively like the way birds fly or fish swim, um, to, to come in a collective mind and actually make decisions together. And they're smarter, bolder, better, um, more accurate than decisions anybody can make on their own or in voting modalities and they're they're proving it around gambling um, mm. arenas because they want something where they can see an actual result they can see wow we did 85 percent better than the experts in that field um but i'm talking to them now about how do we do that around social issues i think we're currently doing it now collectively across the globe we are standing up for black lives collectively yeah. someone in you know, my friend said in Australia, I'm going to go do this and show my kids. At the same time, someone is doing it in Los Angeles and yeah. DC. So I think collectively we're doing it. We're still, it's still going to take a little bit of time. Do yeah. I agree the system is, is broken? The system is broken. <laughs> What's one thing you would say to people that you could give them? Because I know we have two minutes left, so you got one minute. What's one thing you would say to people that would change the momentum of the way the world's going to bring it to a more collective mind? I would say, let's start with empathy. Empathy for where you are at and empathy out. I think if we think in those terms, we're going to be okay. Because if we have empathy for ourselves, then we have empathy for those around us. Without empathy, we can't grow. Love it. Emmy, I want to thank you so much for being here with us. I'm sorry we were a little rushed. I would have loved that talk to, you know, your ear off. I would have loved to hear more. For those people who follow the show, thank you so much for showing up. I really appreciate it. If you like the show, share it with people you like. That's the way things grow. People like something, they share it with people they like, and then it makes the world a little bit bigger. Um, before we go, is there one last thing you want to say? I would say get involved. 
make some good trouble, make some noise. We need everyone at the table, on the streets. That's the only way we see change. Love it. So get involved. Thank you again so much for being here. Thank you, folks, for listening. And until the next stranger comes into the room, which will be later this afternoon for me, but will be probably tomorrow, the next day for, for you until it gets out. Thank you so much for being here with thank us you. and sharing it. Okay. Bye. Bye.